testing. Yes. Good evening. My name is Mike Shadlin. I'm a professor of neuroscience and a, an investigator at the Zuckerman Institute for Mind, Brain, and Behavior. Oh, thank you. And, I, and I'm not a, um, a public speaker, apparently. At least I don't know my technology. Anyway, uh, my name is Mike Shadlin. I'm a professor of neuroscience and, a, and an investigator at the Zuckerman Mind, Brain, Behavior Institute. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first of our this year's series of Stavros Nyarkos lectures. And um, this, year, this year we have a, a great lineup of people that are going to all uh, work out uh, various or explain various intersections of how the brain works, how it learns, how it develops, and how that relates to diseases and things that affect our everyday lives. Now tonight, uh, we'll be starting with um, Dr. Scott Small, who heads the Alzheimer's Research Unit at Columbia University Medical Center. And the title of his presentation is Understanding Alzheimer's Disease Through Anatomical Vulnerability. And um, so we're going to hear, I'll, I won't, I won't uh, take uh, um, the, uh, the thunder from Scott's amazing talk that we're going to hear, but it's uh, ultimately one of the big problems in understanding disease is why disease affects one part of the brain and not another. And by solving that particular fundamental question, uh, Dr. Small believes that that's going to lend insight not just into Alzheimer's disease, but into many other diseases as well. And we're going to hear a lot about a particular part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is critical for memory. Now, before we get going, um, I'd like to um, uh, mention that this uh, series of lectures is made possible, possible by the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, and we're grateful to them uh, for uh, being a partner also in all of our education efforts. And um, um, to, um, in addition to all this, they, they um, support this um, teacher scholar program, and I hope there are people represented from that, that, um, that um, enables uh, high school and middle school science teachers to bring the excitement of neuroscience uh, into the classroom. And so please join me in thanking the Niarcos Foundation for their wonderf wonderful support. So, you know, it's, it is an incredible time right now at Columbia University because of this uh, excitement about brain science. Uh, and um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, there's a new institute just up the street at 129th and Broadway. Um, I have a lab there. And uh, uh, very exciting things are, are going to be happening, are already happening there. And uh, you're going to hear a lot about, about that over the, over the course of the year if you come to more of our, of our uh, events. So um, let's see, without further ado, I suppose, um, oh, I should mention one other thing is that we do remain honored by Mort Zuckerman uh, and, and the Green Foundation, uh, um, with, along with the Arcos Foundation, for their philanthropy towards our goals. And um, uh, there's a lot more work to do, uh, and um, we hope that many of you will partner with us and uh, um, learn about the brain science and, um, and help us uh, grow. Um, and so um, uh, now, without further ado, we're going to hear from Scott, Scott Small on understanding Alzheimer's disease, um, and, um, and especially uh, his uh, research as it focuses on this particularly interesting part of the brain, uh, the hippocampus. So please uh, welcome me in joining, uh, in, <laughs> join me in welcoming Dr. Small. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming this evening. Uh, special thanks to the Stavros Nyarchis uh, Foundation. <coughs> a couple of centuries ago, we were all called uh, natural philosophers, not scientists. And in that era, the idea of having public talks, salons, was very common. And we've kind of veered away from that as we've become more and more technical. Uh, and so I really acknowledge this attempt at rekindling that effort. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I'm a, um, I'm a professor of neurology. I'm not a scientist of neurology. Uh, and we take our pedagogic responsibilities seriously. I'm a teacher first and foremost. And because of that, I'm particularly delighted uh, that the high school students and their teachers uh, from the community are here. Uh, and hopefully, we could help inspire a, a next gen uh, of scientists. <coughs> 
So the anatomical vulnerability in the title uh, reflects this somewhat obvious idea that one way to understand, diagnose, and treat any disorder uh, is to localize where in the body the problem resides. Now that seems so obvious as to be an internal idea, but it's actually relatively new in the annals of medicine, certainly Western medicine, which of course began in Greece. Uh, and whether you start with Hippocrates or Galen, for most of medicine's history, the focus really were, was on bodily fluids, the humors as they were called. And it's kind of, it's shocking to think that the focus was not on trying to identify the organ that was causing the symptoms. Uh, and this began to change in the late Renaissance and was formally codified uh, in this wonderful textbook by Morgani, who was an anatomist in Padua University. And um, I will translate his uh, seminal book, uh, whose title is The Seats and Causes of Disease Through Anatomical Investigation. And he has this great uh, uh, quote assigned to him, where he says, when presented with a patient, listen to the cry of the suffering organ. Um, and that, I think, is obvious but again, just 250 years old. Now into the 19th century, with the introduction of cellular pathology and cellular theory, uh, the listening devices needed to improve. Uh, again, from a historical perspective, it's kind of shocking to think that only 150 years ago did we fully appreciate that organs were made up of different cells, uh, and so now a cellular population within an organ is the unit of disease, and so we need to listen to the cry of suffering cells. And I end the sweep historically by the beginning of our field, modern neuroscience, which <coughs> was driven in large part to this elegant work by Ramon y Cajal, uh, one of the true luminaries in our field, a Spanish uh, anatomist, again, who showed for the first time that the brain is made up of cells. And I say that because, in fact, the brain was the last holdout against this idea of cellular uh, organization. Um, throughout the 19th century, all organs were clearly shown to be made up of cells, but the brain was debated whether that's even true into the 20th century. And the reason is, is because neurons are small, hard to see, uh, and Cajal armed himself with these special staining techniques that allow him to visualize the cells for the first time, brain cells, neurons. And I'm showing here a picture of a structure that Michael already mentioned, which will be the focus of my talk, uh, and that's the hippocampal formation or, or the hippocampal circuit. Uh, and using his standing techniques, an incredibly intuitive, and some would say artistically inclined capabilities, uh, he was able to really identify the, functional, the, the, the beginnings of the functional organization of the brain. So he was able to show that the hippocampus is made up of different neuronal populations and that it is structured as a circuit. And the circuit is true till today. Now, what Cajal could not have intuited uh, is the clinical aspect of the hippocampus. Into the 20th century and our century, more and more diseases are shown to, to affect the structure of the hippocampus. Now I'm showing you the hippocampus on a side view taken by an MRI. Um, I've highlighted it in blue. Um, and it's really remarkable that these diseases, and the list is even longer, affect the hippocampus. So without really knowing much about these diseases, I think you could intuitively sense that, or, 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 or query, how is it possible that this one structure of the brain uh, is involved with so many disorders that are clearly different? And in many ways, that's the motivating question that has motivated our lab till today. Um, and so, in many ways, this is a violation of Morgani. If you think of a structure equivalent to an organ, how could the same structure be implicated by different diseases? And the resolution is, in fact, cellular pathology. Because now, if you slice the hippocampus down its long axis, and you look at that slice, you see the circuit again. Now it's shown in a histological slice. Uh, and I'm showing you the different regions and the different circuits. I'll talk about a few of them as we go along. But what is very clear is that each hippocampal subregion houses a distinct population of neurons, distinct in their molecular makeup, distinct in what they do. And it's because of that distinction, or that sort of um, molecular anatomy, that a number of years ago we uh, 
set forth a hypothesis that has really motivated us. And that is, insofar that we imagine that disorders of the hippocampus are mechanistically distinct, the odds are they'll target different parts of the hippocampus. Sort of a simple assumption based on the cellular pathology idea. But in order to do that, we need tools that can listen to the cry of suffering cells, suffering neurons. And so the question might be somewhat obvious or easy to articulate. The answer uh, and the tools to answer that question are not. And so let me just highlight some features of that challenge. Um, I'll be focusing today on Alzheimer's disease, and many of you might have family members or friends with Alzheimer's. And if you think back to the beginning of when they started having their symptoms, it started subtly, with just memory loss. And then gradually, and that's because Alzheimer's starts in the hippocampus, it starts focally. And as it progresses, it sweeps throughout the cortex, leaving C profound cognitive impairment in its wake. It starts clipping different areas of the brain that are critical for our thinking abilities, for our personality. Ultimately, Alzheimer's is a devastating disorder that robs us of our personalities. Uh, in terms of how that informs our question, what that means, because of this anatomical progression, we can't just rely on post-mortem tissue. So up in the medical school, we have many patients who volunteer their brains to science when they die, but that's at the end stage. If you really want to know where things begin, you have to take a snapshot at the beginning. That's the first challenge. The second challenge, as illustrated on top, <coughs> is that Alzheimer's progresses through different stages in terms of its cellular pathology. It ultimately causes rampant cell death. That's what neurodegeneration is. But in its earliest stages, it causes the cells to be sick, not dead. So they're still there. They're just malfunctioning. And that becomes a challenge. How do you listen to a sick cell? It's much easier to try to detect dead cells. And so that's what, why in the early parts of our program, we spent three or four years trying to be sure of our technology, tr trying to optimize uh, technologies that were developed, <coughs> that were available, to be perfectly suited for our questions of mapping hippocampal dysfunction. So on your left, you can see an illustration of functional imaging. So basically, in a very simpli simplistic sense, you can take all of imaging, by which I mean, and you're probably familiar with MRI, CAT scans, x-rays, into two kinds. You can take a picture of the structure of an organ, the anatomy, or you can try to uh, detect its function by which we mean metabolic changes in cells, sick cells. And what the uh, illustration on the left shows is if you imagine two different <coughs> groups of neurons shown in yellow, some with high and, or, uh, and some with low metabolism, uh, all of functional imaging relies on this very interesting relationship between neurons and the overlying vasculature, the capillaries. And so neuronal metabolism requires glucose and oxygen. And so there are imaging techniques, cameras if you will, that have been optimized to capture uh, glucose uptake and oxygen metabolism. You can also look at blood flow. As an area has more or less metabolism, there's more or less blood flow. With more blood flow, you have more volume of uh, blood in a particular area. And then down below, you see the different imaging techniques at different cameras. So for the first three years, we deliberately explored all combinations of the different variables in, in the different cameras. And for the students in the room, uh, maybe one message is always make sure you know your technology. Remember Cajal, he had his technology. Uh, it might seem obvious, but you'd be surprised. <coughs> and so after this sort of exploratory phase, this sort of technical R&D phase, we found that one variant called cerebral blood volume fMRI, and I'll just call it CBV fMRI from now on, seems to be best suited for our scientific questions. For a lot of reasons, which some are technical, I'll leave, 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 uh, leave for now, but fundamentally, spatial resolution matters. You know, the new iPhone just came out, better spatial resolution cameras. It's true also in our cameras, and CBV is the only technique that has submillimeter resolution, very, very fine resolution, which is required to see the tiny subregions of the hippocampal circuitry, 
in humans and in mice. And one of the things Michael mentioned is the sort of interface between clinical and basic. And I'll illustrate a little bit later about how having a technique that measures the same readout, the same uh, information in patients and animal models uh, is experimentally quite powerful. Now, over the years, we've generated a number of papers trying to test our hypotheses about regional vulnerability. I'm just going to show you the latest iteration uh, of the work. Uh, and so the first thing to, to acknowledge is that this is new technologies that were developed by biomedical engineers in the lab. Frank Provenzano uh, was a graduate student. He then was a postdoc. And uh, he now is an assistant professor uh, in the neurology department. And he's really outstanding. Usman Khan is an MD-PhD, was an MD-PhD, did his PhD in my, in my lab, and now he's a neurosurgical resident uh, at, at, in San Diego. And they were able to really develop these algorith alg algorithms, these very sophisticated computer programs that allow us to do the following. So I could take any of you, put, us in one of our, put you in one of our scanners, generate a CBV map, and using this almost push button technology, we can isolate the hippocampus of each individual, and then we can co-register it. We can put it in the same space. And what you're seeing here is co-registered hippocampi of around 30 individuals. And you can see it works very well just because this is a exquisite rendering of the way the full three-dimensional complexity of the hippocampus looks. So this actually is such good spatial resolution that we can learn structural information. We can know if the hippocampus is smaller or larger. But remember, these are CBV maps. They contain metabolic information. They listen to cell sickness. And so now this is just sort of a cartography of the hippocampus to remind us all that there are two of them on either side of the brain. There's the kind of front, back, and middle, and then if you slice it, you can see the different hippocampal subregions. So now what we can do is acquire these images in patients and controls and simply ask what part of the hippocampus, if any, is, a, is linked to different disorders. And this is some of our newest results that come on the background of a lot of older studies. And the reason I like this is because I think you don't need to know much about hippocampal anatomy or imaging, wherever you see color here, these are parts of the hippocampus that are linked to these different disorders. So you can just see that the patterns are different. And that must mean, based on sort of um, Morgani, Virchowing ideas of different regionality, that these are uh, different disorders. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the importance of that in a second, but let me just introduce the key players here. In Alzheimer's disease, it's a part of the hippocampus called the enteronal cortex. And more specifically, there's an area called the transenteronal cortex. We, we sort of get into geographical uh, infighting in the field, but you'll see why this is important towards the end. And in normal cognitive aging, this map was generated by looking at around um, 80 individuals across the lifespan and asking what changes, and it's the dentate gyrus, a different part of the hippocampus. So by using this technique in multiple studies, in patients and in, 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 in healthy elders, in animal models, uh, we have these interesting um, patterns of hippocampal vulnerability as illustrated here. So the red is meant to show areas that are most affected by a disorder and the blue least affected. And the interesting thing, which we did, we, we did not expect, is you almost see a, what we call a double anatomic dissociation. There's complete difference between Alzheimer's and cognitive aging. And the reason I emphasize that is because when we started, I, I, it wasn't really a debate. The dominant view was that cognitive aging, this normal age-related memory decline that all of us will experience when we get older, uh, it used to be thought that that was the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease. And, and, the reason, and that was a plausible view because, in fact, uh, Alzheimer's affects older people. It starts in the hippocampus with memory loss. Uh, we can't really detect it very well. Plausible. I was in the minority view, in part influenced uh, by a mentor, uh, Eric Kendall here, where we, um, we knew that animals uh, also develop age-related hippocampal dysfunction. So here's the basic 
reason why I was in that sort of minority camp. All mammals have a hippocampus. That's just a fact. It's, they're incredibly similar. Molecularly, structurally, all mammals develop age-related hippocampal dysfunction. We are the only species who are cursed with developing Alzheimer's disease. So it would seem just unlikely on grounds of biological plausibility that we would be the only species spared this non-Alzheimer's age-related memory decline. That was what motivated us. We weren't sure. By showing this difference, that debate now has been put to rest. And that's important for many reasons, to try to understand the cognitive phenotype of aging, to try to intervene with aging versus Alzheimer's. But our ultimate goal always has been to identify these re these, th this pattern so we can begin to ask, well, what is the molecular drivers of this pattern as a way to kind of, as an avenue to get into potentially causes of the disease. And let me just highlight the Alzheimer's pattern for a second. I mean, this is quite remarkable. I think Michael hit on it really nicely. These are two neighboring areas. They're highly connected, right? And so often when, you know, the kind of <laughs> uh, generic answer we give to what causes a disease is a combination of genetics and the environment. These two regions in a patient who has Alzheimer's disease, they have the same genetics. They have nearly the identical environment. So, so why is one affected? Why is one resistant? And that's exactly uh, why we believe that answering that question will give us some deep insight. Now, one thing we can do is, uh, the field can do, going back to the brain banks we have where patients donate brains, we can go into the hippocampus, scrape out cells, we, we harvest the cells of the enteroinal cortex, and we can compare patients and controls. That's gonna be very, very messy, I think intuitively. All of us here have different enteroinal cortices that are different depending on uh, our genetics, our, our, our environment. Uh, but the logic here is to rely on the resistant areas to try to constrain those sources of noise. So this is sort of a two by two factorial analysis as a statistical concept, but it's, I think, self-evidently true. And that is what one can do now based on these patterns of vulnerability and resistance is isolate the enteroinal cortex and the dentate gyrus within a brain of patients and controls. And now what we can do is we could profile the molecules. There are technologies that allow us to look at all the molecules in each sample. And we can perform what would be called a double subtraction. We can compare enterinal molecules to dentate gyrus molecules, patients to controls. And that's a very good way at trying to uh, constrain the sources of noise and pinpointing Number four there, the quote unquote pathogenic molecule, the causative molecule, at least in theory. <clears throat> and this is exactly what we did uh, in a study that we published now a number of years ago. Uh, and um, we found two molecules, two proteins that were deficient in the enteroinal cortex selectively of patients uh, and not controls. And this all cohered around a complex called Retromer. So I'm gonna now explain a little bit about what Retromer's part of and why this has become such a big story in Alzheimer's disease and why now pharmaceutical companies are targeting Alzheimer's for therapeutics against Alzheimer's. In order to do that, uh, allow me a sort of a transition slide uh, to introduce the idea of protein trafficking. That's the term in textbooks of cell biology. So you remember, maybe, uh, that cells are not just bags of neurons, but they have different organelles, different stations. And each station, proteins are processed differently. This is how cells work, to produce proteins, to, 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 to distribute them, to secrete them. And once Mother Nature decided that the best way to do that is to have different stations, different organelles. She needed to solve the problem of how to traffic proteins precisely from one organelle to the other, from one station to the other. <clears throat> and that's what the arrows show, the different pathways. Now in the world of a neuron, it turns out that one organelle in particular is critical. And this is called the endosome. You can see it there on the upper uh, right. And the reason for this is based in the fundamental function of the brain, right? If the 
heart is a pump, if, if, if the liver is a, fil is a filter, brains are essentially cells that connect like a computer to belabor a metaphor. And so um, here you can see two neurons connecting. And when they fire, what happens are you have these proteins, receptors, in the receiving neuron, which get endocytose. They get internalized. And what you see there is the early endosome. And the early endosome, as you can see there, is trying to decide which pathway to send the cargo, in this case, the receptor. The most important pathway is what you just saw there. It's the recycling pathway. It delivers the all-important receptors and other proteins back to the cell surface. And it's at the cell surface that all the action happens. And so if I now simplify this into a cartoon picture, here's the endosome, which in many ways can be considered grand central station for a neuron in terms of trafficking. There are three ways out of the endosome. As car we call cargo is any protein that enters the endosome, uh, um, a receptor, but other things as well. And, and I'll illustrate its relevance to Alzheimer's in a second. You have the retrograde pathway going back to one organelle. You have a degradation pathway. And you have a recycling pathway. And it's the recycling pathway that's critically important for the health and the function of a neuron. If you're paying attention to this talk, you are now recycling receptors. Uh, and I'll show you where exactly in a second. <laughs> uh, it occurs to me it would be nice to have a, a, a mobile fMRI where I can actually show it on the fly. <coughs> um, and so if, if the endosome, sort of to anthropomorphize, needs to kind of decide, well, how to, which, which pathway to go, and do I degrade the receptor, do I send it back to the cell surface? How does it decide that? It decides that by different uh, molecular machines that could be thought of perhaps as uh, train masters or conductors. Uh, and Retromer turns out to be a critical molecular machine that functions in diverting cargo in two out of the three pathways. From the endosome, the retrograde pathway. In fact, that's why Retromer was dubbed Retromer, because it was first shown to traffic cargo from the endosome back to the TGN. That's a technical point. Um, and then subsequently, it was shown to traffic cargo from the endosome back to the cell surface. <coughs> Now, <clears throat> you will not be surprised to know that Retromer is a complex machine made up of d different proteins. But the critical part of Retromer is, that, is those three proteins shown in different shades of green that are called the cargo recognition core. They're considered the Retromer's core. Uh, the, and I'll name them VPS35, VPS29, and VPS26. And these were the proteins that we found deficient in the enteronal cortex of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And they are considered the core because as you can see, all other elements of this complex machine bind that platform, much like you know, a Lego uh, 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 construct. And so this was, when we stumbled on this in 2004 before we published it, we knew nothing about Retromer. Uh, and I, as, as my wife was here, no, I, I, I rarely admit ignorance, but I feel better because the field knew not, nothing about Retromer. Retromer was just four years old. It was first described in yeast. There were just 10 papers. Now there are thousands of papers on Retromer. It's become a very hot topic within cell biology because it's so important how to traffic out of the endosome. And subsequently, we and others have shown that it's linked to Alzheimer's disease. But how do you really link so it was, it was an exciting finding uh, for us, certainly, but also, I think, for the field. But how do we shore up the argument that these deficiencies that we observe are truly causal to the disease, are driving the disease? After all, despite our fancy statistics and modeling, we found them in post-mortem brains after patients presumably had Alzheimer's for many years. Maybe the deficiencies in those proteins were just dying, uh, were just a sign of a sick cell. How do we know that they're upstream, that they're driving the disease? Well, there are a number of ways in which you can do that. 
and a number in both ways have been now validated as implicating retromer and Alzheimer's. The first is showing that if you manipulate systematically retromer, which you can do in cell culture and in animal models, do you develop um, the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease? So histologically under the microscope, Alzheimer's is, is, is characterized by two abnormal clumping of proteins, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, Alwaz, Alzheimer's himself, described them 110 years ago, practically to the day. Again, back to the point of technologies. Obviously, Alzheimer's disease had existed forever, but they were invisible until there were special tools that can visualize them. And so he, he described this, but for decades, no one really knew much about Alzheimer's. People thought it was just this rare disorder. And then in the golden era of Al Alzheimer's research, one of the first critical discoveries were finding the molecular building blocks of the neurofibrillary tangles and the amyloid plaques. So it turns out that amyloid plaques are produced by little peptides, cleaved proteins inside neurons that have been, these, the, these naming schemes are sort of almost arbitrary. This one's called amyloid beta. It was the second amyloid related protein found. We now call it A beta. It gets, it's produced in neurons, it gets secreted, and then it starts clumping into these uh, uh, ab abnormal uh, aggregations called plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles, its building block is tau, just a name of a protein that, is, that was shown to be the core constituent of these neurofibrillary tangles. There are now over two dozen papers, and we've contributed uh, a number of the papers, to clearly show that retromer deficiency is linked to amyloid pathology. This is a slightly busy slide, uh, but let me just take you through it at, at a basic level. Start with this blue protein, which is called APP, the amyloid precursor protein. It is the parent protein that, is, that it once cleaved produces the A-beta that then secreted to cause amyloid. It's known that APP is cleaved at the endosome and trafficked from the cell surface, much like those receptors I was showing you earlier. And it's known that the enzymes are found here that lead to what's called APP processing, resulting in the increase uh, in A beta. So in the setting of retromer dysfunction, as indicated by the X's here, you simply can't, you, you prevent or you slow down the exiting of APP out of the endosome. So remember that, that, that cartoon I showed you, just think of this very dynamic process. Things are always flowing in and flowing out. All it takes is to slow the flowing out just a little bit. APP gets stuck in the endosome. You have more A-beta production. You have amyloid plaques. And the reason why this was very appealing at the time to the field is because for the longest time, we didn't know why amyloid is produced in late onset Alzheimer's disease. I make that distinction because there is a very rare form of Alzheimer's called early onset Alzheimer's. We, we rarely see them, and if you know anyone with Alzheimer's, they probably don't have uh, this very devastating, aggressive form of the disorder when presenting in one's fourth and fifth decade of life. Those are ca caused by mutations in either APP or the enzymes. So it's, that, that's been known for 20 years. But those mutations don't exist in late onset Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for 99% uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And so this provides a cell biological reason for why amyloid is produced, at least one reason. There are other reasons perhaps as well. Um, and I make that distinction, the distinction between molecular biology, looking at proteins and mutations one molecule at a time, versus looking at cell biology, which is really focusing on the pathways and the mechanics of those pathways within a cell. <clears throat> retromer has also been linked to tau pathology. If you manipulate retromer in animal models, you'll develop tau pathology. That's been established. What's not been clearly established is the precise mechanism. This is still works in progress, but it clearly is linked to tau pathology. Uh, and uh, since we're not sure, I, I, you know, I won't go into the details. Now the other way, if one is lucky, 
to show, to, 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 to strengthen the link between a molecular observation and causality is to see if there are any gene, gen, genetic defects in retromer-related molecules. Of course, if there is, that is a very strong case because we're born with our genes and they occur before the disease. <coughs> Richard Mayo, who's, a, uh, who's the chairman of my department, a colleague, a friend, a world-class geneticist, uh, he and his colleagues looked at retromer-related molecules uh, and found a mutation in one of the retromer-related molecules, SORA1, the, the name doesn't make a difference. But this is, the, the, he first observed this a number of years ago, but now this has emerged as one of the strongest genetic links for late-onset Alzheimer's disease, which makes a very strong case that this pathway is important for Alzheimer's. And he and others are now finding other genes that are part of the retromer machinery that link the genetics of Alzheimer's to retromer. So I uh, think retromer matters, but I, of course, uh, even in my most exuberant moments, don't think that retromer is the whole story. But I, 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 I will tell you what I think might be a unifying story at the cell biological level. And I suppose I have to say that because we just published a paper where we formally declare this hypothesis. Remember, the difference between molecular and cell biology. If you look at, there are around 20 genes that have been linked to Alzheimer's. In this review paper, uh, and Sabrina Samoas is here, one of the postdocs who was an author of this paper, you, and you investigate what they do, many of them seem to cause a defect in endosomal trafficking, particularly in the recycling defect, and that's what's illustrated below. One way to convince yourself that that's right uh, is to just think sort of plumbing. <laughs> if things traffic out of the endosome, right, in and out, in and out, if you block the exiting out of the flow out of the endosome, think you might expect the endosome to get larger and larger. And that's exactly what is seen reliably in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, here, this is an actual endosome that's big, boggy, and dysfunctional that you don't see in normals. This is from a, a, a neuron from a patient with Alzheimer's. This is a control. And so in this review paper, we put forth the hypothesis that endosomal traffic jams are pathogenic, i.e. they're drivers. They are a central cause to Alzheimer's disease. Now, I'll tell you uh, in a few minutes why how this has now been translated potentially into therapeutics. But first, I'd like to uh, share with you some unpublished work that in my mind is a finish line in my lab, which is, it's nice 20 years later to start uh, hitting finish li lines, win or lose. You want to reach the, the end. <coughs> and th this is the question, why is the transenterrhinal, which is a specific area of the enterrhinal that seems to be affected first and foremost in Alzheimer's, why is it vulnerable? What I've shared with you uh, is evidence of how we relied on this pattern of vulnerability to find retromer, and then all kinds of studies that sort of validated it. But it doesn't necessarily circle back and say that why, it doesn't explain why the transenterrhinal is vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease. And so the work I'm going to share with you uh, is the work of two lab members, and again, if there are students and you're sort of taking notes of what's important, always have great students and great colleagues. Uh, both of these uh, um, lab members certainly typify that. Sabrina uh, is a hardcore cell biologist who came to me from Paris via Portugal. Uh, and uh, she has done most of the work I'm going to show in a second. And uh, she is now being promoted to assistant professor. We're trying to keep her here. Ja Gua is another star, and uh, not everyone's a star, I'm celebrating the stars, um, is a, he, he was a biomedical engineering student, a graduate student in my lab. He just defended his thesis, and his thesis was so remarkable that he actually was able to leap over the postdoctoral fellowship. Usually you do graduate school post, and he was actively recruited uh, to be in the imaging center uh, at um, the new neuroscience institute that Michael was talking about earlier. So what did Sabrina do? So 
here's again the three elements that make up Retromer, VPS 29, VPS 26, and VPS 35. And Sabrina knew from just reading the literature that one of these elements, VPS 26, has two forms. They're just slightly different molecular forms of the same protein. <coughs> In this case, the nosology makes sense. They're called VPS 26A and VPS 26B. But people knew that, but people didn't really pay attention, and that's sort of reasonable because there are many proteins that have slightly different forms. That's just the redundancy of nature, and they don't really make a difference. But she had a hunch that they might. So the first thing she did, which I'm not going to show you the kind of, this is a six-year project at least. Uh, the first thing she did is to show that VPS 26A and VPS 26B cohere around two separate retromers. Chemically, they're separate and distinct. Not trivial to show, she showed that. The second thing she showed is that VPS 26B retromer is found almost exclusively in brain. So here's brain, here are different other tissues, different from VPS 26A. And then uh, within the brain, you might know there are neurons, but other cell types, she can show that it's found primarily in neurons. So at this point, I started paying attention. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a while. And because that is just by itself, uh, an interesting observation. Retromer, the VPS 26, 29, VPS 35, VPS 26A is found in every cell in our bodies, in every cell in the biological world, from mammals to, to, to birds to flowers to yeast. Every cell has retromer. Neurons are interestingly endowed with its own separate, distinct retromer, has two retromers. That must mean something. At least that's what, what we thought, and that's what's been borne out. So what Sabrina did is used a whole series of cell biological techniques to show that the VPS 26B, the neuronal enriched retromer, is dedicated to the recycling pathway. And the A is more into this retrograde pathway. And that and she did this in many ways, just to show you what I'm showing you. This is just um, uh, what we call confocal microscopes, very high resolution microscopes where we can tag different parts of the retromer and then tag the different retromer elements and see where they localize. And she can do this also functionally. She can manipulate each. And so there's a whole series of sort of checklists you have to do to, to, to rigorously conclude what I just did, what I just concluded. Now, at some level, that might be good enough because I told you earlier that the recycling pathway is of fundamental importance for the integrity of a neuron, for synapses, for dendrites, for learning and memory, for the integrity of, of, of the nervous system. And so you can just sort of hand wave that and say, sure, that's why neurons have evolved to have a separate dedicated retromer, and I think that's true. But we can take it one step further. What we can do is, we can generate a mouse where we can knock out the neuronal retromer and we can knock out the ubiquitous retromer and simply ask, are there different parts of the brain that are more or less uh, dependent on the neuronal retromer? And this is where uh, I think we were particularly delighted and this is Jaws' beautiful work. So now what you're looking at is a mouse brain. This is the olfactory cortex. Yeah, okay, we'll play it again in a second. Uh, this is the back of the brain here. <laughs> this is the mouse brain. But what you're looking at is CBV or metabolic images. What Ja did was um, take images of some of the normal mice and some of the mice in which VPS 26B, the neuronal retromer, was knocked out. And again, co-register them, compare them, and ask is what part of the brain is affected. It, we half assume that it would be large swatches of the brain, if not the whole brain. And quite remarkably, we see a very strong effect, and it's incredibly focal. It's selective to one area alone. So I'll play the movie again. Wherever you see color, the, this is an area of the mouse brain that's affected. You see they're both sides. That's affected primarily by retromer dysfunction, the neuronal retromer. So what area is this? You can answer that by taking a slice 
And lo and behold, this is not just the hippocampus, it's not just the enteronal cortex, it's the transenteronal cortex, the specific pinpoint region where Alzheimer's begins. And again, let me reemphasize that the transenteronal cortex in mice and our, and our own transenteronal cortex is very similar. So this is, one, this is why we've submitted this to a, uh, a, um, a big journal, because we think that this is a finish line, because it really now is beginning to tell us why the transenteronal cortex is vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease. Because in, in essence, what's, what it's saying is, and she has other markers of recycling endosomes, that the transenteronal cortex neurons have a lot of endosomal recycling. And so if you have a lot of re endosomal recycling, that's where you're going to have the defect. We could have left it at that, and we sort of did, but it begs the question, well, why is this area? Why does it need endosomal recycling? Uh, and uh, we entertain an, an idea together with Larry Swanson. Larry's a, Larry Swanson is a, is a sort of um, uh, a circuit-based neuroscientist out at USC in, in Los Angeles where he could look very precisely using these painstaking techniques to map the circuitry of the brain. Of course, we all know that different regions of the brain are connected. So he can ask, what areas of the brain have the highest connectivity? And so this is from one of his older studies. And when we place it onto a human brain, it turns out the red is the area that has the highest connectivity. The red is the transenteronal cortex. And Again, as a, as a hand wave, it's not completely surprising. The hippocampus, as Michael mentioned, is important for learning and memory. It is a sort of funnel where all our cortex, as you're thinking now, it's funneling into the hippocampus through this tiny little area. So it's being bombarded all the time. And so the basic idea is as follows. If you have an area with high connectivity, remember, if you stimulate a neuron, you're going to activate the recycling pathway. You have an area that has a lot of recycling. And so more connectivity, the wheel goes round and round. And remember, many defects in Alzheimer's are wrenches in that wheel, in that cycling. And so we think that's the reason why uh, this area is affected by Alzheimer's disease first and foremost. And if you, know, if you wanted to get... Um, uh, philosophical, you can say, okay, well then one way to decrease our risks for developing Alzheimer's is to stop thinking, stop cogitating, <laughs> uh, stop enjoying life. I would strongly advocate against that. Uh, I don't think you need to be a scholar to know that it's worth thinking, although there's interesting questions about meditation. <coughs> we believe it's worth the risk to stay thoughtful, uh, nuanced uh, and to enjoy the life of the mind but we also believe that one could perhaps inoculate against these wrenches by developing therapeutics against retromer delivered to the enteronal cortex and that's what I'm going to end with I'm going to end with kind of a new chapter in the lab and that is can we target this defect so Here's this review again. If we're arguing that from a cell biological point of view that these endosomal traffic jams are driving disease, can we unjam the endosome? Can we increase flow through the endosome? Easy to hand wave. But again, most, most drugs target molecular biology. They target single proteins or enzymes, receptors. This is a little bit different. This is targeting cell biology, targeting a pathway. And so in this paper, uh, which was a um, collaboration with Greg, uh, Greg Petsko and Dagmar Ringa, who are hardcore structural biologists, we, we at least proved the proof of principle that you can. And what we did here, and, I, I, and we sort of tapped into our years of insight into retromer biology to postulate that if we could find a chemical that would stabilize that all-important core, pro, uh, core retromer, maybe it would increase the levels and increase its function and keep things flowing. A lot of assumptions. Remarkably, we found a couple of these proteins or small chemicals. 
So what you're seeing here are three-dimensional rendering of actually the, the way the retromer looks uh, down in the cell, the three-dimensional complexity. The, the, the orange is one part of VPS 35. The blue there is VPS 29. That turns out to be the most important elements in stabilizing the retromer. And right in between, you can see nestled in the crevices of both are these small molecules, which in fact do stabilize the retromer and do increase the levels, as shown there on the right. And most remarkably, we show that it increases the flow out of the endosome. It reduces A beta and seems to do good things in cell culture and animal models, not yet in humans. But at least it's a proof of principle. And so this really is an interesting finding because it means that you can, in theory, increase the levels of one protein and have a beneficial effect on a complex machine. And so far, every time we do this, it seems to be very safe. It doesn't seem to harm the cell to have more, flow, more things flowing out of the endosome. And so this has led us to another approach, which we're now actively pursuing. And this is gene therapy. This is a sort of a general topic. Gene therapy is a technique where you could take viruses, you can defang them and make them non-viral, non-infectious, but exploit the um, the molecular capabilities of viruses to cause a cell to increase the expression of a protein. It's, they're called viral vectors or gene therapy. They're now being used in more and more disorders. They had a beginning that was kind of sketchy, but now they seem to be working. And so can we use this technology to increase the expression of VPS35 retromer uh, in the brain, uh, and this is work done by Asir Qureshi, uh, another very talented postdoc in the lab. And he's injected in one part of the mouse hippocampus the viral vector containing VPS35, and this is a control, uh, and we can zoom in, blow it up, and wherever you see red, that's VPS35, exogenous, ex uh, uh, VPS35 that we introduce. And, we can, and we're starting to show that, again, this is remarkably safe, and we're starting to see good things happening. This is early days, but it's extremely encouraging. And so I'd like to end by just making the point that there is a, there is a point to where academicians have to work with folks in pharma uh, industry. Uh, I think it's very clear where the baton passing has to happen. We're very good at um, maybe generating hypotheses, validating stories. Once it's validated, uh, despite our hubris and thinking we can do anything better than anyone else, we're not very good at developing drugs. That's what drug companies do exceedingly well. And so we've been trying to collabor collaborate with companies, uh, many of which I'm involved with. So there's chaperones uh, gave rise to a company, which is now also part of Denali Therapeutics. Retromer Gene Therapy, I'm working with a New York-based company uh, that focuses on gene therapy called Miura GTX. Uh, and al also, actually, the MRI techniques that we developed, uh, industry thinks that might actually be useful for diagnosing Alzheimer's. This is a new company for that. And I'd like to uh, end by a, some acknowledgments. I tried to focus on most of the uh, folks who worked uh, on this. Um, and again, kind of a final point to the students, always have good, good labs, have good collaborators. Uh, and Greg Petsko, Richard Mayo, Eric Kendell. Uh, and of course, uh, one needs to acknowledge funding agencies because that is critical to fund all this work. And I'd like to end by thanking you for your attention. I realize I covered a broad scope here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a retired lawyer, so most of what you said went over, over my head. I, but in college, I was in. <coughs> turn on, okay. But in college, I was in ma mathematics and physics, and th the distinction that you made between cellular and something else, right. whose name I don't recall, molecular, re molecular, reminded me of a distinction in, in physics. <coughs> 
between dynam dynamic systems and kinematic systems. And then in the dynamic systems, you're, you're concerned with what a particular force does, the force of gravitation and so forth. So thinking of this in terms of what you were saying, uh, in the kinematic system, you're concerned about <coughs> equilibrium, about balance. In your retromer system, uh -huh. again, mu mu much of which I didn't understand, you mentioned three pathways. Yeah. So in the kinematic system, you asked the question about balance of those three pathways. Right. Does it, does it sometimes happen that something goes awry because one pathway is being used more than the other. E exactly. Or, or so forth. No, I mean that's so that, yeah. That's, no, that's, that's an interesting question. perspective from sort of physics and yeah. I mean, you know, I use the uh, Grand Central Station train track metaphor, but I, you know, you could use planetary motions perhaps, and uh, and 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 things are dynamic, and it is very much the case that if one pathway dominates, the other is deficient. So you definitely need to reach the sort of thermodynamic equilibrium <laughs> in the brain. I'm a retired physician, so most of what you said went right over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very simple question. What is the F in fMRI? What's different? Uh -huh. Yes. Functional? Yes, it stands for functional. So you have, sometimes we call it S, structural MRI, and F, fMRI, functional MRI. It's a fuzzy term. It's just used sort of for code because what exactly is function? And that's why I try to pin it down to metabolism. Thank you. Okay, this has to do with the CVV uh, MRI that you were doing. So is this like a new sequence that you were creating or is this part of like ASL or something like that? It, it's sort of, so ASL is a way to measure blood flow. It, it's actually, the, it's, in many ways it's very old. Um, CBV, so when people, sometimes it sounds like you're in the field, in the field of functional imaging, fMRI, even the New York Times covers it often, there's one form of it which is called bold blood flow. In fact, CBV was the first one on the block historically. But it fell out of favor because you need to inject contrast agent, you need to start an IV. And in a world where you don't really care about spatial resolution, you might not need CBV. But as I think I tried to articulate, for us, re spatial resolution was paramount. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you would tie in the endosome defects with recycling with the um, beta amyloid plaques and the tangles. And I've read a lot about exercise um, yeah. helping that as well as sleep, you know, sleep deficiencies worse. um, worsening beta amyloid plaque yeah. buildup. So can we bring the two theories together? Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. So exercise is something I've published on. I actually think exercise, and this is, you can see why I think this, because if nothing else, I think according to functional neuroanatomy, we, we published work showing that exercise benefits the dentate gyrus, the area that, that is linked to more a aging versus Alzheimer's. And I think it probably will help Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's will always win out on that, on that fight. Although clinically, when I see someone who I think has cognitive aging, the first thing I recommend is physical exercise. In terms of sleep, a colleague of mine is publishing a paper soon who's going to show that when you're sleep deprived, you actually activate certain areas of the brain, maybe even this area. And when you activate it, you might actually get a lot of endosomal recycling. So the sleep deprivation story vis-a-vis -vis perhaps an increase risk for Alzheimer's does fit with this to a certain extent. Uh, do we have time for one more? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is a really good one. It's about amyloid plaques um, are found commonly. Now that we can act we can actually, I, I talked about our imaging technologies. They're incredible other imaging technologies that can image amyloid plaques in living people. And many people have amyloid plaques, yet they don't seem to be affected. So there needs to be something else. And, and that's exactly where the field is. The, there is one dominant hypothesis, the amyloid hypothesis that says amyloid is everything. 
I am in the camp that says it can't be everything, almost because of that, but other reasons. And so you were trying to suggest a what it would be the other X factor. It could be inflammation. It could be tau. Uh, if you have both, you rarely are completely normal. If you have one, not the other. So it's probably a tandem effect. Thank you for a fascinating talk, Dr. Small. Uh, I was wondering, so the, uh, I'm sorry. I'm yes. The common um, view is that, or the lay model is that uh, amyloid plaques are found extracellularly. Yeah. So how does that occur if the, it's an issue with the recycling? Sorry. Right. So, so what happens is, is that the amyloid plaques are absolutely right, or are outside the cell. <coughs> The building block of amyloid plaques are A-beta. Mm -hmm. That A-beta is produced inside a cell, and then it gets secreted from the cell. And so when you have recycling defects, mm -hmm. you have increased production of the A-beta inside the cell, and then it just secretes more and uh, aggregates more in the extracellular space. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, um, let's um, thank Scott for a fabulous lecture. <laughs> and, um, You know, uh, we're both neurologists, and we're both celebrating, in a sense, I think it's just a spectacular example of how you go from almost serendipitous findings, curiosity-driven science, to making it all the way to you know, drug companies and hopefully, the ne I won't say the cure of Alzheimer's, but you know, it's, it's, it's the, that kind of movement that I dream of as a neurologist studying basic science of how the brain works, and Scott is living the dream. So um, I think it's fantastic, Scott. Thanks thank so thank much for starting us off. Thanks. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the Niarcos Foundation again for their generous support, sponsoring these lectures. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, so much interesting things happening here in the Zuckerman Mind Brain Institute, and we hope that um, some of you will join us on this journey in any way you like. Um, visit the labs, um, learn about the brain, uh, and support us. Um, so I hope you've t enjoyed tonight's program. I'm supposed to tell you that our next lecture is here in this very room on Thursday, September, I mean November 15th, and that is going to be by Dr. Nim Tottenham, and she's going to, I think the title is Getting a Head Start, The Developing Brain and the Importance of Early Experiences. So um, with that, have a wonderful evening. Good night. Kali Nikta. Sure, of course.